I'm here interviewing Paula Free. She is an adoptee, a mixed race woman. She has two black children and she identifies as being black. And she was raised by white parents, Caucasian, and her story is incredible and how she's dealing and coping with Black Lives Matter right now, all the protests. And her and I are gonna have a conversation about white privilege, about being black in America. And I'm gonna talk about what I feel about this whole experience too. And I'm gonna be a white person that doesn't keep quiet and stay silent. So that's what this conversation is gonna be about. So join us. We need to talk. I hope that we can live in a world where racism and prejudice are in the past, but the realist in me knows that we need to fight it at every turn. It is so much more than just not being racist. It's time to stop being silent. You have a responsibility to speak up and stand with the black community during these times. Not just on social media, but in real life. Yeah. Yeah, I said it. But sometimes you have to take to the streets. Sometimes you march. You uh, you force your voice to be heard. Now I understand that there is this saying. Do not have conversations about religion or race at the dinner table. And you want to know what I say? Fuck that. I say that is the perfect opportunity to have those hard conversations. Now more than ever, it is imperative that you vote if you want your voice to be heard. Ask yourself, how do you want to remember your role in this? And with that, I say let's go. Let's put on our fucking boots because it's time to march. White silence is compliance. White silence is violence. Be brave. Challenge yourself and challenge the people around you. Please, stand up for what you believe in and use your voice. You know, you were transracially adopted by white parents, right? Yeah. Just think of what? like, like, I mean, I think for black people going psh, like, oh my God, like she actually has some form of white privilege, right? But yeah. then don't. Well, it's for me, it's, it's not as extreme either because I'm mixed. So yeah. like I can pass, people can think I'm something else. They can think, what are you? I mean, <clears throat> most white people don't say I'm white ever, but black uh -huh. people say I'm white. So people saw you as white. They didn't no, see you. Not in my white, not when I was growing up. I was definitely other. I was called the N-word. Oh, you were? In school. I was called the N-word. I was called Oreo. I was, so I got the racist, you know, treatment. Mm -hmm. you, knew you didn't belong, which, which only probably exacerbated that feeling for an adopted person. Like you really don't belong. Like, where do I belong? You feel more marginalized. And then my parents they were trying to prepare me for life. So they're like, you're a woman of color. You're going to have different standards. There are going to be different things that yeah. the world, the way the world is going to treat you is going to be different. You're going to have to work harder than a, a white woman or a white person. You're going to have to be prepared for facing certain inequalities, you know, things. So they're trying to prepare me, but their message to me was your life is going to be a struggle. Mm -hmm. It's going to be very difficult being you. You're going to have a very hard life. <laughs> so that's all I heard as a little kid. You know what I forgot to mention? My whole adoption story started because of racism. Oh, so my me. white mom uh -huh. had sex with a black man and had me. Mm -hmm. So her dad, her white racist father, told her, you cannot keep that baby, that black baby. You, We will not have that baby in our family. So if you do, I'm disowning you. So she left the town to have me give me away and then go back home because you know she was young she didn't and whatever else like she didn't know how to stand up to her racist father yeah, yeah. and how do you live a life without a family that you've known i mean that's wow that's women do cool. do that but she didn't choose that okay whatever but that's my entire that's my entire 
beginning. Like that began my adoption journey. Wow. Racism. Yeah. yeah. Then when I meet her, she's like, yeah. oh my God, you look the least black of all my kids. And I, and I gave you up. <laughs> and I was just like, oh my God. Like, I don't even know what's happening right now. Right, right, right. But she went on to marry a black man and have more biracial children. Wow. So she did not listen to her own father. He eventually came around and loved her children. But he died. I never met him. Oh, okay. What would, that, you, what would you want to say to him if you could? If you could, if you, he was here, what would you say to him? Because you're his granddaughter. You're his granddaughter. I know. Like, what would you say? His racism, his racist, ignorant, evil, narrow-minded. I want to know why. I want him to answer the question. Yeah. Why are you afraid of black people? Yeah. Why? Like, why are black people not equal of value? Why are they, why is their humanity not valuable? I want to know. Like, tell me why her keeping a, ch a black child was so threatening to your existence. And I forgive you for your stupidity, but I'm, I will never be like you. Like, I changed this family's, this family's racist disposition forever like you realize like I would tell him you realize that like your racism ends with me like your ancestors all y'all is no more like we are forever equally qual like for yeah equal my grandma yeah my adoptive mom's mom said really terrible things about them adopting me and my mom basically like reduced the of it, like the uh, contact we had because I love my grandma, but I didn't know she was such a racist. And so my parents limited her contact with her, my grandparents because of their racism. So anytime there was racist people that would say something, cause that's the thing. White people will tell you other white people at yeah. that time. Like, what are you doing? Why, why would you adopt a black kid? Like my grandma was like, why would you adopt a black kid? Why would you do that? And so it was not even accepted in my adoptive family. My parents got married in Africa. My adoptive parents. And they my parents are Caucasian. You were adopted by two white parents. Yes. They were married in West Africa, Sierra Leone. They were in the Peace Corps. Wow. So that's where they were, went to um, serve. And, but also my dad's side of the family like my um, dad's mom loved Jesus and she was very much a lover of people mm -hmm. so there was that whole other side where it was like you love people like you all people God embraces everybody mm -hmm. and all people matter and so it was that I feel like that like saved my parents and raised my dad to be this really amazing person. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm really glad that I got placed with my adoptive family. Like I'm not against adoption and I'm not against white people adopting black kids <clears throat> as long as they fight the fight with them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes white parents back up when they need to be stepping up. Mm. There's a lot of talk about it's complicated. Like, you know, like it's like, okay, you have to sit down with your family and have a conversation and, and you may trip over your words and go, well, maybe I am a little racist sometimes. And I just need to say it out loud to name it, to tame it and go, all right, let me acknowledge it. Because what we fear incubates, what we fear incubates and what incubates only gets bigger. So you have to bring it out to just whoosh, expose it so it doesn't incubate anymore. And I think that's what's happened in our country and around the world. It's just incubated, incubated. And now it's just, it's just exploded. Enough is enough. Absolutely. So your adoptive parents had a biological white son. Okay. Yes. Your older brother growing up. Okay. So he wrote something to who? My son. Oh, I'd love to hear it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. I'm going to probably cry when I read this again, but I'm going to read it. So this is my brother who's a year younger than me and has 
always loved my children, like treated them no different than his own children. Yeah, yeah. So he said, Andre, I just want you to know how much you are loved. I will never know how it feels being an African-American male in the United States. Although I have witnessed injustice and inequalities towards African Americans, I don't live it day in and day out. I went on a five mile run today through some neighborhoods in his city all on this morning. All I could think about was my white privilege and how I felt a hundred percent safe. I then tried to imagine being an African American and contemplated if I'd feel the same way again i will never truly know how you felt growing up or the issues you may face on a daily basis i sincerely hope major changes will begin to happen throughout america soon love you and please stay safe uncle dan Aww. it was just so heartfelt it was just so like like I will never get it. I will never understand. Right. But I know it's wrong, and I know you don't deserve to live in a society where this is going on. Yeah. And that's basically his message. And it was like, whoo! It was. That's like perfect. Like that's perfectly said. That's all you need to say. It's so easy. Like it seems so, so easy. You know, but. I think you said the fear for some white people is they don't want to come off saying the wrong thing. I don't know what it feels like. I, ha I, I do feel relatively safe. People don't look at me different, but I can only imagine what that feels like. And I'm just, it just breaks my heart. It breaks my I know heart. it does because you are that compassionate and you really love all people. You fight for people on a daily basis. I mean, I've even thought about contacting LAPD and teaching them on trauma informed practice, which helps them slow down, be aware of what they're putting out there and also reading the nonverbal cues of those that they're working with or they pull over and assessing and understanding the psychological and emotional impact of number one, being pulled over anybody and how their demeanor they are the thermostat, that they set the tone. And tone means everything in relationship. And it is about relationship first, connection first before the correction, before the ticket, before whatever it is it's going to happen. But you got to connect first. I think.